myself. My name is Andrea Getches or Drea. I'm an associate partner with Education Elements. Really excited to be here with you. Um, in a former life, I was a special education teacher actually in Arizona. I saw that Cheryl, you're calling in from Arizona as well. I was in Glendale School District um, and then moved into instructional coaching and have been with Education Elements for the past five years. Really uh, fortunate and honored to work with folks across the country in um, instructional initiatives, but most specifically thinking about strategic planning and return planning um, and helping folks develop plans that remain flexible and, and um, can adapt to the time. So really excited to share a little bit about that content with you all today. I'll hand it over to Dana. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dana Britt. I'm calling in from Maryland and um, have been fortunate enough to be able to be a teacher and also a district leader before joining Ed Elements and have worked with our districts primarily in New York around their strategic plans and return plans and excited to share some thoughts today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer Disler. I am um, from New Jersey, calling in from New Jersey from a public school there, assistant superintendent. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Ed Elements for the past um, three going on four years now. And um, they have helped us um, in creating our strategic plan and um, have been a partner with us. And so I'm so excited and humbled to be here um, today to just share with you some of our experience in our district and hope that um, it might change some of your um, adjectives towards strategic planning for your future. So thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks. We're so lucky to have Jennifer. I mean, uh, Jen makes all of it happen in South Brunswick. And so what we'll be doing today is we'll be talking a little bit about our approach and then also highlighting how this has looked in South Brunswick and um, how Jennifer and her team have led this. So some of you all might be familiar with us as an organization, but if not, I'd love to give a little bit of an introduction. Um, we are a national consultancy that's been around for 10 years. If you haven't heard, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary this week with a lot of celebrations. We'll give you some details at the end, um, but just We've been incredibly fortunate to work with uh, so many school districts. And if you see, we get a lot of people who come back and just like Jen mentioned, we've had um, just ongoing relationships for a really long time that we're really fortunate with. But I think something that we're the most proud of is uh, that number on the right is just how satisfied people feel in workshops or in our engagements overall. And so we just hope to share a little bit of what we've learned over these past 10 years uh, so that you can start applying them. And just like Jen said, hopefully those descriptors those adjectives, adjectives start changing a bit too. Um, so this is kind of an update. We, we have been working with uh, adding more districts this year. Uh, and like I mentioned, we, uh, we went from instructional support and have really expanded our services and the things that we offer. So you can see here, we'll be talking specifically about strategic planning and um, I think how it overlaps in return planning. But if any of these other topics are interesting to you, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to share a little bit more about um, our work there. And then finally, this is um, how we're gonna be spending our time. So we wanna talk a bit about what responsive planning is, how COVID has kind of changed the game, changed the landscape and how, uh, how we anticipate uh, districts will be adapting. And we're gonna be talking about those five ways um, that we think uh, strategic planning will be different. So uh, Jen's really gonna be able to highlight that for us um, as well and just seeing how that, uh, how that has played out in South Brunswick. And we also wanna make sure we, make, we leave some time at the end for question and answers. We'll pause throughout. Um, so please feel free to use the chat, use the question and answer um, tool. We'll be monitoring that and making sure that we get to, to any questions that you have. I'm trying to see if we have any questions. Um, this is like the Drea show right now. I'm really sorry that you're hearing me talk so much, but I'll share a little bit more context about how we operate or what we think about in, in strategic planning. So uh, I think the thing that you should know about us is that uh, while you can develop a strategic plan that has a lot of the same components, I think from the many different experiences that people have, you'll notice on the top and in the bottom, we have a lot of things that sound familiar, uh, mission, vision, values, initiatives, how you create priorities, but I think something that we've learned over the past few years is that the plan 
is important, but really how you do the planning, the action of planning matters just as much, if not more, as the plan itself. So how you engage folks throughout has been something that we find incredibly important. Um, because we believe that the planning process can set you up to develop a structure that is ongoing and reflective that you can continue to build on. So I want to introduce a few terms that we think about when we when we're doing responsive planning. Um, we like to think about planning as, like I said, that action, making sure that we're not just thinking about what is on the page or what is on the paper and going beyond that and thinking about how do we make decisions and how do we make sure our plan works for us. So a few terms that I think are important. One, um, a pivot. So we really believe that you set a direction, but that you should be planning to change. So this plan for change, not perfection, we wanna make sure that you're changing your strategies, your, um, you know, the tactics that you're using, but you're really going in the same direction. And, and Dana will talk a bit about an analogy here for that. Um, we believe in sprints. So planning in short spurts, getting action and momentum moving forward. We find that that's a way that you build capacity. You get other people energized and excited about this work. Um, and then we also like to employ the concept of safe enough to try decision. So making sure that we have um, people making incremental decisions and taking risks when it feels safe and when um, we can all norm on what that means. We also wanted to share an analogy that's been really helpful for a lot of our districts uh, between thinking of your plan, is it more like a farmer's market or more like a cathedral? And when we say that, what we're meaning to say is that a lot of times with strategic plans, they become these grand, grandiose, five year, sometimes even more plans. Um, if you look on the right, I had the opportunity to go to visit the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona a few years ago, if any of you have had that opportunity. And that uh, cathedral is still unfinished because that plan was so grand. Um, and instead of thinking about our strategic plans as those grand cathedrals, what if we considered them as farmer's markets? So each week there might be different stalls, there might be different stands, there's different produce based on the availability and thinking about how different shops pop up and pop down. That's kind of when we're saying, when Drea was sh sharing about responsive planning, how can you make your plan to, to use one of those adjectives to be that responsive plan that's constantly pivoting and constantly changing rather than being that thing that's set in stone? And why that's so important on the next slide, as all of you have personally witnessed, is that we have undergone just a monumental shift with COVID this fall and spring as well, the past nine months it's been. Um, so to, to use one other quick analogy, when I was a, a child, I love spinning tops. I don't know if any of you all also love spinning tops. Um, setting them off, seeing them just like the one on the left, being able to just once you started it going, just continuing in its, its perfect circle, as long as it's able to. My, my younger brother, his favorite activity was coming over and gently nudging my top. And, and it, as you all probably know, what happens at that point is that the top spins off, veers completely to the right, completely to the left, off in different directions. And that's what I think is what COVID has done for us. Our districts had these really tightly wound, like plans, we had our priorities, we had the vision of where we were heading this year. And all of us, I saw in the chat, a few people said uncertain, a few people said unclear, paused. That's what's happening right now with strategic plans in some districts because it feels like we had our plan on the left and COVID came in and gave just the slightest nudge and, and flung it completely off course. So what we're hoping to share with you today is a little bit more about what five areas are that we are seeing districts across the country to rethink their strategic plans. Each of these is gonna anchor our conversation. We'll share a little bit about what the challenge is and then we'll hear um, from us and also from Jen about how districts are rethinking and, and trying new things with their strategic plans in the wake of COVID. So the five areas that we're going to talk about we see plans becoming more short-term, more flexible, more community-driven, more reflective, and more refocused. We'll talk more about what that means with each one. 
is there anything in the chat just to pause that we I love seeing um, Rachel's comment about including voices from every level of the organization. We completely agree, Rachel. And in that community driven section, we'd love to hear more. Um, in all of these sections, if you have thoughts about the things that we're sharing, the metaphors, the analogies, or any of the other insights, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. So the challenge in terms of plans needing to be more short term, um, I don't know if you all saw this article that came out recently on WebMD, but Dr. Fauci said that a mass and social distancing are likely to continue until 2022 at the earliest. Um, hearing that made me think about our quote unquote new normal and what we are going to be con continuing to feel and to see in our districts. So why we think it's so important that plans become more short term. First off, five years feels a lifetime away. We are not sure what's going to happen tomorrow in our districts. We're uncertain of budgets, expectations from our state of what our, the spring is going to look like. Will there be waivers for accountability? What will budgets look like with um, turnover in administration, particularly at the federal level? level? And we are also seeing our districts, some struggle to prioritize strategic planning while they feel like they're in crisis mode. When you have to put out a fire in your building or you have to respond to a COVID case today, it's hard to try to convene a group of folks to talk about what we're going to be doing in five years, right? Um, so we are seeing our districts consider ways to make their plans not these five year cathedrals, but again, that uh, much shorter period of time that they are trying to map out. A lot of the districts got a taste of this with doing their return plans and it was being able to support them with that and showing them setting a short term plan, a short term goal and seeing um, the, the success with that has been, I think one turning point for some districts in thinking about their plans as being more short term. So with that, we're going to ask Jen to share a little bit about how in her district, she's considering um, think, making chunking and making her strategic plan more short term. Yeah, so for us in South Brunswick, um, you know, when we when we thought about the short term piece, it kind of made us focus on a couple different things. One thing that that we do always in the short term, and it kind of has lended us well, especially in this COVID time, is that we always have an annual theme. So it helped us kind of to embrace COVID this year. On the left there, you can see that our theme this year was that there's always a silver lining and for we're encouraging all of our staff really to find theirs. And there, there are silver linings in this time. And one of them really, there is a silver lining with our strategic plan because for us in the short term, we were able to look, and I think some of my other slides later, you'll see a little bit more vetted out, but one of the things we had to do is start to prioritize. And somebody mentioned um, in the chat how things are on pause and it was the same for us, um, but what it's helped us to do is reprioritize a bit. And we, um, for an example, I'll give you um, one thing that we had in our strategic plan and our plan was a three to five year plan one thing that we had in our plan was um, a one-to-one -one initiative. And I feel like we might be the last school district in New Jersey to get to one-to-one, -to -one, but we, we had the plan for it. Um, but very quickly after we implemented our strategic plan, our finances shifted and we lost a lot of um, state and federal funding. So that really got put on pause. But with COVID, a silver lining for us and a change in our short term was that we needed to prioritize and get our students with the tech they needed and get our teachers. So it really became a silver lining and it refocused us. So a, a move to having one-to-one um, truly uh, was something that could happen and we were, were able to use some of the CARES money that the federal government was giving and um, make that be a priority and even get our community involved. Um, you can see on the slide on the right, um, we took a lot of time in the short term to, to look at specific things and engage a lot of stakeholders. So similar to the strategic plan, like that person was saying about in, involving a lot of your stakeholders, um, we did just that. And um, so we did the same thing and used some of the same strategies and tactics that we learned in building the strategic plan now. And so we brought together um, 
uh, a whole host of stakeholders to be part of our responsive pandemic team. And again, I think I can comment more on that when we get to the community side of things. Um, but short term was important for us and it, it helped us just to shift and gain perspective a little bit. I, I wanna go back and ask Jen to ask you a question. Sure. Do, you, um, do you feel like, what, what were you able to do to ensure that people still continued to focus on the strategic plan, even when it felt like there were the fires of everyday life? Like how, how have you seen that long-term planning, even though it is a little bit more short-term play out for you? I think like everybody on this webinar can agree. Like, I think we all feel the like heaviness of COVID. And I think acknowledging that and being able to let our folks breathe a little bit, but then um, kind of look like, I feel like part of my job in central office is always to keep the big picture. So for my buildings, I, I feel it was really important to keep a pulse on where they're at. So I knew when and know when, and I am still trying to find our way, but knowing when we can then push forward. So one thing that we shared with our public and with our staff is that, you know, we know this is our reality right now. And we know that we want, um, you know, us to kind of just keep our heads above water. But we also know that we are going to be out of this and into some new normal at some point. So there are some things that that have to just continue. So for example, we continued with implementing some new curriculum this year, because we knew ultimately whether we were remote or not, it was really to the benefit of our students and to the benefit of our, our teachers to have a better curriculum to implement. So it's just kind of a matter of being choosy about the why behind it. And, and really, you know, is it going to impact kids? Is it going to help um, grow our, our district forward? Um, or is it something that it would be a nice, but we don't need it right now? So I, I always try to keep that kind of lens. And I, I feel like our central office here really always keeps that kind of focus. And that's what helps us make the decisions and kind of know when to push and when to just let everybody breathe. Um, hope that answers what you're asking. Yes, of course. Yeah, I'd love to add just a, a little context here too. Um, Rachel, you talked about storytelling in the chat and how important that is in, um, you know, inviting stakeholders in. And I think that that's something, these slides are just like a little sample of what I think Jen has done in the district is sharing, you know, this is how we made decisions. These are the different things that we considered. And I think that that's also important in short-term planning is being able to kind of articulate how decisions are being made or how, um, you know, who was involved, how, how the decision came about. And I think that that's also been something that you all have done really well in South Brunswick. Thanks. So not only do we want, we believe that plans need to be a little bit more short term at this point, we think it's very, very important. And we've hit on this already that they are very flexible. And we wanna talk a little bit more about what that could look like. Uh, I shared at the beginning that I'm calling in from Maryland. My husband and I just bought our first house um, and it's on the Chesapeake Bay. And so we've been learning how to sail. We have no background in sailing at all. And to get out of our, our area, we have to go out of a cove and sail directly into the wind. And I've learned through that process that it is literally impossible to sail directly into the wind, that you have to actually um, do something that's called changing tack, where you start sailing off to a little bit to the right for a, a bit of time and then pause and then sail off to the left and pause and then sail back off to the right. Um, and so the reason that I shared that is that I bet that all of you right now are feeling exactly like that in terms of your strategic plan this fall, that you're sail trying to sail directly into the wind, that you feel stalled. There's no wind in your sails. And that if you do have to sail off to the right for a bit of time, that those in your district might be feeling like they're wasting time, they're heading in the wrong direction, then having to switch back over and communicate with stakeholders that we're sailing in a little bit of a different direction. But that is literally what we've learned in sailing. The only way to sail into the wind is by doing that process of constantly changing tack. Um, and I know that you also may feel that a worry that you're that you don't want to put down into a strategic plan all of the the priorities or the initiatives that you want to achieve because you worry that you're going to have to just throw those out when because everything is changing and shifting 
Um, and what we wanna talk about a little bit more is how you can um, think about that differently and make sure that you're putting in flexible points. Yeah, and we introduced this at the beginning, um, the, the term of pivoting. So just a, a reminder that it's a, strain, a change in strategy without a change in vision. And I think that's the, the analogy or the story that Dana shares is a perfect way to describe that you're constantly making shifts um, to adapt to where you want to head. So uh, using pivots in the terms that, um, that you use or the language that you use uh, gets people accustomed to the idea that we're going to change our strategy a bit, but that doesn't mean that we're, we're headed in the wrong direction. And that just means being clear on what stays fixed and what stays flexible. So some of the things that we encourage people to stay fixed on, and I know Jen's going to speak to this in a moment, is, you know, we stay true to our mission, our vision, our values, our beliefs, our North Star and the outcomes that we want really need to stay um, firm because people need to always know where they're headed. Things that remain flexible are the, you know, some of the priorities that you have identified, um, outcomes that, that you identified under those priorities to determine whether or not you're successful might also need to change based on the experiences that you have um, or the conditions or the cards that you're dealt. And I think, Jen, you can probably speak to this too, thinking about the pivots that you've had to make with COVID and just how you were thinking about that in general with some of the initiatives that you all uh, set out when you, um, you know, finalized your strategic plan. Pivot has become a, 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 a vocabulary term in, I think, every day of our operations here. Um, and I smile every time I hear it because I don't know if anybody in the audience, I'm going to do it, Dre, I'm saying it. I always do think it. of the Friends episode, <laughs> think of Ross and the couch. And so it always makes me smile. Um, but pivot <laughs> has been part of our terminology. And um, two, two aspects of it. One is the COVID piece and how many times for all of us in our decision-making in our districts and having to pivot and having to readjust and be flexible in what our plans are. And so on the left, you see some samples of um, some, some, some uses and some reasonings of why we needed to pivot. And so, you know, we, we knew that there were going to be, um, um, our, our hope of what we wanted to happen. And then as you know, things changed, CDC guidance, um, more cases, we had to then pivot and make other decisions. So that idea of being fle flexible and the use of pivoting during COVID has been huge. It also has impacted tremendously our um, strategic plan. And on the right, you see um, a, a, a dashboard per se of our initiatives. And um, for us, you know, some of the things that aren't gonna change are, are our priorities and our focus. And these all are embedded in our mission. And we have some big buckets of wellness, academic programs, student supports, community and growth. Um, for our district. And we knew, um, you know, prior to COVID, we had a plan, we had things in progress, we had things being sustained, and some things even being ready to sunset at this juncture. Um, but we had to kind of look at the reality and make some some pivots. So I give you an example. Um, down with, com with community, we had something um, in the plan for Family University, which is this awesome idea about how we engage our community and give them resources and support. We've always done something called parent academies, but we wanted to build this broader and we wanted to almost make some kind of on-demand type of resource for every level, every grade, wherever your child is, what they, you know, to be a South Brunswick student, to be a South Brunswick family at that age, what they need. Um, and we started working on that. Well, that is, a, is, is an awesome thing that we want to have, but for us, our reality, and it goes back to the short term and what the needs were, we knew we had to pivot a little bit. And so what we ended up doing was pivoting to, to that community aspect, knowing we needed to reach out more to our community, but we also needed to provide right now more around social emotional learning. And we ended up doing our parent academies um, and focusing there instead of this broad university that we know will ultimately help all, but right now we had to kind of hone in. So it didn't undo, but we had to pivot. Um, another, another idea was collapsing some of these initiatives. For us right now under growth, 
um, diverse candidate hiring. I don't know about around the nation and it's so neat to be in a webinar with people from all over the country. Um, but here in New Jersey, it's really hard to hire anybody right now. So the, our idea of embedding these new practices of having as, as much of a diverse candidate pool as we can, that, that sort of is in, um, you know, we're just trying to get people to, to work at this juncture. So we had to kind of pivot and change our strategies based on, on what's happening in our environment right now. Um, so, so those are ways that we, we definitely had to pivot in our plan. Um, this was a visual that we presented to our Board of Ed and to our community to let them know that, you know, we, we have the strategic plan and our mission and vision hasn't changed, but right now, because of the environment, we've had to make some adjustments and we continue to update them. Um, but I, I do feel confident because of the, the planning that we put into this and the way we built our plan, it allows us to be flexible. It does allow us to pivot. Um, my word was flexible and the way it was built from the start, not even knowing anything about COVID, obviously it's it, we still it, it's given us the ability to be flexible so anything coming our way we can shift to make the wind hit how it needs to hit and not have to take it head on and jen as someone who didn't work with you through this i know that you work closely with with drea looking mm -hmm. at this it's really clear and easy for me to be able to see what your the key areas that aren't changing your initiatives there. And then uh, I don't know if the folks on the webinar can read the key on the right, but it says the green ones are continuing progress. You have some that are on pause, some that are sunset setting and some that are maintaining. And um, can you speak a little bit more about mm -hmm. the reaction that folks had to this and if they understood those, those terms and how um, that communication went? Did they feel like, why are you, why are you making us veer in this whole wrong direction? Or was it more of a positive response? <laughs> I, I think, honestly, it was more of a positive because for some of those initiatives that we paused, it was passionate work that people were doing, but they've gotten consumed by other needs right now because of our current conditions. So it actually was, um, this was an, a great tool because when we first built this, and, and I have to say, this was a strategy that we learned from Drea and Ed Elements. And it was fun because we brought it to life. I. I made this like a, vis a visual and we had posties and we had colors and everything matched and we spent a lot of time designing what was going to go first and what had high importance and and something that could be done faster than other things and these were all protocols and strategies we learned from Ed Elements and what it did there because there was so much time investment and so many stakeholders that when we had to make this change this year and back in the summer when we kind of said hold on here we need to reprioritize it was kind of welcome and it was also um, not um, all that new because they had seen this and had been working with it already. So it just kind of said, okay, well, this is what we do now. And um, it was easy to communicate to the public as well um, because we initially, you know, this, this dashboard has been part of every update to the community and to our board. So um, being able to bring them into the fold um, was, was helpful. We also had a board member um, and community members part of our, our our stakeholder team. So it helped um, even just kind of that messaging and, and helping to know how to bring it to the public. Yeah, I love that difference between on pause and sunsetting. And I, I hear from teachers all the time, I, you're putting one more thing on my plate. So yeah. to say, this is still important, we're pausing it, it doesn't going to go away, but it's something that you can take away from your plate right now is I think really helpful. And it's interesting too, because you see, we don't have anything sunsetting. So many of these things, it's not just a task list that's going to be done and be over. There might be one or two things overall when we're said and done with our plan that might sunset. Um, and, and that has to do with um, the redistricting and reconfiguring. Once that happens and we're ready for that, that's going to be a task that then will sunset because it'll be done. It'll be happened. But a lot of these, I think, will never sunset. They'll just, they'll live on in different ways which is interesting. Yeah, and I, to get a little more like meta on this slide, I think something that, that I would share too, just for everybody on the line is that through these different strategies, Jen and her team have really normalized the idea that change is going to happen. So 
it's more of like what change has happened rather than, oh, why is that going away or why is it on pause? There's a lot of clarity and um, comfort with things shifting. So I think that, that that allowed, I mean, and this was a dashboard that you all developed prior to COVID that I think just really translated well when it was like, okay, we need to pause a few more things because of the priority shifting. Um, and I think something that that speaks to, I think goes right into the community driven piece. Like we, we've we noticed not just in South Brunswick, but across the country, this is another dashboard that we have of a, of a district in New York that we worked with, that we really have the community's ear right now. People are highly invested. I don't know that, and everyone's like, I feel like a local celebrity because so many people are coming to our board meetings. And if you think about it, like we really do have the community's ears. If you see here, we had, um, just looking at by the numbers, the sheer interest that the community shared in just return planning and how to how to support their students at home. So there were multiple town halls, stakeholder groups. Um, there were committees developed to to take a lot of quick action. And um, I mean, you can see some of these responses to the surveys. I'm sure that many can echo those sentiments here. It's, it's a great challenge to have. We have so many people invested and we have so many families that are seeing learning from a different perspective. That now, how do we, how do we engage folks in a way that feels um, collaborative and supportive uh, and, and helps us really invest further in engaging our community uh, moving forward in those short-term, long-term strategic plans that we're developing. And stakeholder engagement has always, as Drea said, been so key in strategic planning. But what we're seeing that maybe is the shift moment is really thinking about how solutions or pivots, if you're going to have to make them, can be co-designed with your community. So there's a few of our districts right now that we're working with and helping them to develop family and parent focus groups or surveys or experiences where this fall has been unprecedented. None of us have ever done virtual or hybrid learning or socially distanced in-person learning. So to ask them for their parent experience, for teachers experience, for students experience, what are, what are you missing from the traditional setting? What do you wanna let go of? And when we return to the new normal, it's not that same way, that same normal again. What, how has student engagement been? What are the needs around social and emotional learning and mental health? Because we know that those are going to be so important. And then once we've collected those trends and we've collected some of those quick wins and ideas, bringing those back to the community and then co-designing solutions. So hearing a challenge of, I don't really know how to support my learner when they're on X or Y or Z program. And then co-designing, okay, what if we had a, a night where you could come and to learn about that? What time would it be? Or would it be offered asynchronously? And having this, the community to weigh in on decisions and to be a part of the solution so that it's not, um, we're, we're all in our ivory tower figuring this out. And they take some of the burden off of us too to have to have all the answers so that we can get our community to not only communicate with them, but also have them to feel invested and have buy-in into the solutions and the pivots that we need to make as a result of this, this crisis. Um, you can pr probably bring both in, Drea. So um, for, for us, this, this is a huge, huge aspect of, of the work and um, it started during the time, and I think foundation being built, um, our, I don't, just to share, um, myself in this position and my superintendent, we came into it at the same time. So it's kind of like this changeover of leadership in central office. And I think it was during our strategic planning time, um, two, three years ago, that we really um, set that model of collaboration and that we wanted that input from all and that it really mattered to us. My superintendent always says that if you're going to ask the questions, then you have to be prepared to, to take the information and do something with it. You know, So don't ask just to, to ask, but ask because you want to know the answer. And on the left there, this was all part of our community outreach um, 
to our strategic plan and what was important, what, what were those big rocks that were really important to the community um, and our staff for building a strategic plan. And we had a, a large outpouring of people. We were so proud of that. Um, and it, it helped us to kind of paint the story, um, give them the facts of, of what we know, knowing that we didn't have all the answers, but then engaging them in conversation of, of what they wanted, you know, learning to look like, what they wanted the facilities to look like, all of those aspects of visioning for a school district. And it, it, it really bared well for us when we shifted into this in these times, because we took that foundation of, of getting um, the community a part of it. Um, back in the summer, I can tell you that we participated in, in, in community forums. And I, I laugh because I would say to our superintendent, like another one, but we don't even know what we're doing yet, Scott. And he was like, let's just listen. And it, it was those forums without us having the answers. And you all know, because you're right there with me. We, we, don't, we, didn't, we still don't necessarily have all the answers, um, but we would share what we knew. And we kind of paint the picture and give the story of what, what schools um, would look like if we went back. And it was really important for us to be um, truthful and share what we knew when we knew it. And it really helped us stay in, in check and in line with our community and our staff. I have to say, um, you know, not everybody might like the decisions that we make, um, but people are understanding. And I think because they know the storyline all along and they've felt like part of the process. And so um, we've built up and ramped up our communications. And that's been a big part that we've learned from our strategic plan and are using now moving forward. So for example, um, we have a health, um, newsletter that goes every Tuesday um, that our superintendent sends out just so our community is aware about cases that have happened statewide, um, community-wide, and then within our schools. So that when a decision gets made, people are kind of in the know and feeling, like, oh yeah, that's right. I kind of expected that because he just talked about how the numbers went up to this in the last week or so. Um, and we, we've continued to do that. Um, we had over 4,000 um, community members come to forums during the summer and in the fall. And I think it, it's because of that, that we're getting, you know, I, again, I, I don't say that everybody's like woohoo cheering for us, but we have um, understanding and people accepting what the decisions ha have been and will be. Um, the the forums for us, the collaboration side of things have really been um, a part of the community structure that's, that, that's helped. And I, I think in a strategic plan as you shift, um, just thinking about how you get the message out there and trying to get them kind of in your head, we continually just try to paint the picture because families right now want their kids back, but really what does that mean? What, what will that look like? We've used a lot of visuals um, and really trying to help families understand well what does that mean because everybody just wants it to be back to normal um, but it really it, it can't be that right now and so trying to be honest and, and continually to communicate those forums then in turn helped our survey responses happen so the forums were a way for us to get out there and also for people to ask questions but then when we followed up with the survey we got large responses um, we're a school district of and a lot of you are in, in, in way larger than mine um, our school district is about um, 8,600 kids. And, um, you know, when we did our survey on what families want, we, we had over 90% response on, on what they wanted and gave input. And I, and I think I attribute it to the foundation we built with the strategic plan the few years back, but then all of that storytelling and bringing them in and, and doing the forums, we, we got the responses um, for it. So um, the communication has been key, needed. Yeah, um, I've definitely seen that to be true, that a lot of the avenues that you all had from the strategic plan, you've been able to repurpose and kind of do them virtually. I wonder, Jen, if you can speak to, um, and you touched on this, but uh, like the tolerance that people have with for decisions that they might not understand or agree with, or tolerance for change. Can you... I know it's not like a way you can quantify it, but maybe you can speak anecdotally about what that looks like. 
it's been up and down, but I think because of, you know, we're in a hard time society wise, right? And there's a lot of fear. And I think news every day adds that fear factor to it. So put that aside. So the things that we have control over, I think by us, you know, giving the narrative and lots of opportunity for questions and voices being heard, there became this, I'll use your word, this tolerance for what decisions were made. They, they knew, they being our community and our staff, knew that they got to have say, that they got to be listened to, and that ultimately a decision was going to be made based on the following factors. Like they knew how we were going about making the decision and why. And I think that then, you know, they might not have liked the decision, but it gave them, um, you know, understanding. So we might not always agree, but we can understand each other. And I, I think it's through this com communication type, this engagement that it really helped us. Um, just like probably many people on this call, our board meetings are now virtual right now, and they are highly attended. And um, I think it's because they know that um, they're gonna they're they're gonna be able to um, ask questions, but also be heard, and also you know um, you know get get the full story and get the full picture. Sorry about that. I had to come off mute. Yeah, thanks, Jen. I think that um, the, the, the continuous update, updates and I think communication, it's not one of our five, but I, I'm hearing that in all of them from you is that it's like all of these little pieces plus how you share it and how you update it and how folks receive and, and they're used to kind of, you know, it used, it's something that Scott does that I think is, um, has always been his in his characters he does these texts and he does like fun um you know for snow days and those have, like maybe they've been less fun lately but they still are an avenue that you all do to communicate out so i feel like those things haven't necessarily changed and people are the information is different but the avenues are are yeah. very similar which i think is I've, I've also seen a lot and i've tried to like kind of copy what others are doing i see a lot of websites that have you know the information all in one place and i'm finding that more than ever families want to know like that they always can go somewhere and get what they need so we've been trying to do that as well we do all these different forums but everything can always be found in one place and our our district website has that kind of covid central um, place for them to get all of the up-to-date information. And again, I, I see that on many districts and have learned from what others have, have done and they're trying to do the same. Yeah, that's I think another thing that we see in folks who bring this type of planning in is they're also like learning. They're looking yeah. to other places for examples. And I think it sounds like a lot of people on the chat are, are thinking about that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this kind of comes into the next piece. I think, Jen, you kind of touched on how decisions are made, how you prioritize, and then how you communicate that out. Um, so something that we talk about during strategic planning is uh, how, how do we prioritize? Everything feels so urgent and so important. And so we, we talk about this framework that we use for prioritization. We did this initially with strategic planning in South Brunswick. So we started thinking about, you know, what has a broader targeted impact and what is more difficult or easy, depending on the common definition that you determine with your team. Um, and so we really find that, you know, this, this structure that we use for like a large plan can also be implemented when we're thinking about setting short-term priorities and goals. How do we determine, you, we, sh we saw that, that dashboard with the pauses and bringing in time to reflect. And really those pauses came out of times where, um, where your team was able to say, you know, we're gonna, we're not seeing traction here, or this just doesn't feel like the right time to continue to push that let's pause, but you had to build in that reflective time to do it and bring in those tools. Um, so just wanted to highlight this tool that we use a lot um, in, in prioritization and, and Jen will speak to this in a moment. I think the other thing I wanna name for, for the folks on the line is that um, through responsive planning, you're, you kind of let go of planning a really detailed plan for three or five years in advance and get really specific about what happens in maybe the first year. And then you reflect and you think about, okay, how can we improve that upcoming? And where do we want to make some pivots? Where do we want to make some changes? And what do we want to add in? Because we didn't really anticipate that that was going to happen. Um, so it's this balance between making decisions and prioritizing and also making that time to reflect. 
And so I know that that's something that you all have thought a lot about in South Brunswick. Here are a few examples of what you all have done and thinking about, you know, building capacity for leaders and taking time to pause and update. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the balance between, um, you know, preparing people to make those decisions and then pausing and updating folks along the way. The reflective side of things has been um, crucial, right? And so no matter, you know, we get so caught up right in the in the heart of it to really take that time to just pause and reflect, it helps you then move forward. And um, the protocols that we've learned from Ed Elements have really transcended through, um, you know, not just the strategic plan, but in really any kind of initiative, and especially during the time times of COVID. Um, so on the left there, you see this was something that our um, admin team worked on in um, back in the summer. So when we were unsure of what the year is going to look like, we needed to kind of ready and get teachers back and determine what right like the very first thing is what are those first two weeks we know what normal school looks like but we needed to kind of think about and we used protocols to help us to be reflective to say okay um what did we do what could we do and then we know we can't do it all at once so let's try to think down the road what are some things that we might save for later in the year and this helped our administrative team frame out those opening weeks for our teachers um so the it was it it really worked well because it it gave them the acknowledgement of what we did and like traditionally um, helped us prioritize what we want to still embrace and then visionary see, well, how do you do that in a remote environment? Um, so that was a great tool um, and it helped our, our staff be reflective. We found like being reflective um, helped us start the year. It was mid-year where it's funny, I think of when I met with Drea and, and we're thinking right now, like um, we wanna do this retrospective again and we were going to do it in November, but honestly, we were facing, like like many of you, um, we were facing, do we start, do we not start? We weren't completely hybrid and there was a, a high increase in cases. And so we were a little bit in turmoil. So at that juncture to be reflective wasn't the time, but we are now at a point for our mid-year for us for January that's going to take place. Um, and that's where you see on the right hand side, we were at this, at this place, this crossroad of what to do. And so we used reflection to like help us make the decision. And so we were contemplating um, the model and what to do. And it's funny, things have changed already. Like we're, we're staying um, remote now um, until after our winter break. Um, but we needed to make decisions on how to move forward. And when we do, and we go into hybrid, we have made decisions because of we were reflective on we want to make sure that, you know, our vision and what's best for kids takes the precedence. Um, so reflection has been key, but I think the, the tip or the the hindsight part of it is just knowing when, because like I feel like right now we're all just trying to keep our head above water, but knowing when to pause and be reflective and remembering that being reflective is going to help you move forward, even though it might seem, you know, um, not the right time to really try to, and especially um, for those of you on this call in that seat where you're, you're, you know, driving, um, the boat for your for your staff and for your whole admin team trying to like even move forward and do the reflective it's important um and i know that like drea has helped me to kind of pause myself to say okay like it is a good point and knowing when it is and when it isn't and trying to find your way but it, it's super important um and i think the hardest part is just knowing when to do it Thanks, Jen. Um, I think some things that we've seen uh, folks do to build in those reflections is sometimes it doesn't even have to be a large session. There's an opportunity for, you know, when you check in with your team saying something and you all do this really well, Jen, is, you know, what's, what's something that's giving you hope right now? What's something that is working really well? So there are opportunities to build in some reflection without having to take a formal pause and, um, so I, I think that you all have done that. And I, I wonder if folks on the on the line maybe have ideas for how you've paused and reflected as well. Um, okay, so I want to make sure that we oh look, surprise slide. Oh, same one. Same <laughs> Sorry idea. about that. That's okay. Yeah. Um 
So last piece, I want to make sure that we have some time for, for questions at the end. So um, I, one thing I want to talk about here too is that the, the themes that are coming up, and this kind of speaks to making those pivots as well, um, but you know, a lot of things are changing right now. And I, like, I want to put up a few statistics. Um, and this was done earlier in the fall, but uh, we had 28% of teachers probably in around October or November saying that they're more likely to retire early. And I found this quote on the right, uh, a really um, stark awakening for me that, you know, it kills me to leave, but it might kill me literally to stay. So we're asking our teachers to make really tough decisions day in and day out. And I mean, you all are making these decisions too. We're seeing school leaders as well considering leaving. Um, and anecdotally, we're hearing this from superintendents, folks who had maybe two or three years uh, to retirement are starting to consider it earlier just because of you know the safety and, but also the trauma that folks are undergoing. Um, so we're noticing a few different priorities nationally that are starting to come up. Um, and this is all including the, um, I think the the reckoning that we're having around that we're having around justice and equity. So I think the first thing is that, um, and I know this has been true in South Brunswick, but that uh, we we know that this is a topic that needs to be addressed, and it is important that it is addressed very specifically in our plans. Um, communities are highly prioritizing this, and uh, we're seeing this, you know, as as formal plans as well, an emphasis on equity and social justice, thinking about incorporating culturally responsive teaching, um, an emphasis on supporting staff of color. Um, the next piece is uh, hiring and retaining strong teachers, in particular teachers who represent the student populations that they serve. Um, and a lot of this means increasing Black and Latino uh, teachers to, to be able to be uh, representative of the students that, that, that they work with. So um, all of these things are also continuing to be true. And then the last piece is we know that the families have had to play a unique role in learning this year. It's not enough to, to be, I mean, people are literally watching their students lessons and supporting them through um, their, you know, not just homework, but the, the courses in general, helping them stay on track. A lot of those executive functioning skills are starting to fall onto the responsibility of families. And so we know that that is also going to be something that we consider and prioritize. What is the role of the parent or guardian in, um, in student learning? So we kind of pose this here is that we don't have a solution. These are some of the things that we're starting to see as trends and um, would be curious if you wanted to add into the chat some of the other priorities that you're seeing in your communities. Um, but we know that this is something that, that people are gonna have to keep top of mind and that's something that we're gonna have to include in future plans.